Well, hello, welcome to Faith Builders Family Church. Praise God. Hallelujah. We are a family of love living by grace where miracles still happen. Praise God. Amen. Hey, listen, I want to talk to you tonight about God is shaping his church. There's things that are going on in this natural world, right? And there's always things, but uh, it's demanding focus. And so for uh, a couple of years now, everyone is focused. Everyone's looking, what's the next uh, report coming out? What's the next thing? Where are we going? What's happening? What's doing? And in the process, our attention is being drawn away from the things of God, right? And we need to open ourselves up and say, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? What's going to happen here? And we've got to look at the promises of God. We've got, we got to stick close to the promises of God and to the word of God. It says he sent his word to heal, to deliver, to set free, and that he watches over it to perform it. We know that the word was made flesh. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. If the word was God, then the word is still God. Yes. Amen? Amen. And that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we know him as the Christ. And he suffered and died. He was raised from the dead, entered into heaven, and he sits on the uh, heavenly throne, the throne of righteousness. And he rules and reigns there. And we're inside of him. And the Bible says that we rule and reign in this life. So if you don't like what's going on around you, then change it. It's not hard to change it. Well, you can change your personal life. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14. God is shaping his church. That's the awesome thing. I mean, the devil and the, the God haters, everybody is just doing whatever they can, distracting people, you know, making smoke screens and yelling and screaming and doing all this stuff. Reminds me of, of Elijah, you know, and the false prophets and they're cutting themselves and they're bleeding and they're in the sweat and the mud and the blood and, and crying out. And, and Elijah looks over and says, well, where's your God? Maybe he went to the bathroom. <laughs> Cry a little louder. He'll be back in a minute. And so they're getting frustrated. And when it's his turn, he says, well, that's not enough water. You know, soak this wood. Go get another bucket and pour it on it. No, I'll go get another bucket and pour it on it. I mean, that's pretty bold, isn't it? Yes. I mean, Elijah knew his God. Do you know your God? You know, we want everything to be just perfect where we have no problems, no bumps, nothing. You know what? Those bumps are going to mess your life up. But Jesus, one of his promises, and I know most people don't like this promise. The Christians don't. He promised that in this world we'll have persecution. Yeah. We'll have trouble in this world. It's a promise. It's here. He said that the enemy is going to be drawn to um, wherever the word of God is unfolding, wherever the truth is coming out, it's going to get the devil's attention, right? So it doesn't matter. He's been whipped and stripped. What do we care if it gets his attention? We just learn who we are in Christ and move on, right? Now look at this in Proverbs 14, verse 9. It says, in the tents of... Of those hating authority, there is error. But in the house of the upright man, there is grace. And we're, we're seeing all those that, that are, are trying to defund the police and, and, and trying to get to the place where um, it, it, should, it should be a law that I can do whatever I want. But it should be a law that you can't do anything you want. And that's... Kind of worse trying to head, right? And, and, and all this, this uh, uh, craziness. And the Bible says there'll be days when people will begin to look and, and say that, that good is evil and, and evil is good. And we're in that place. <laughs> so you need to sometimes just, just stop a minute and just go, ha, 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 ha. 
right? I mean, put things back in its proper perspective. You said what, devil? Listen, the devil isn't our problem as much as it is wicked people. But now God said that our warfare is not against flesh and blood, right? And so the Holy Spirit now is beginning to shape his church. The eyes of their understanding are being opened and enlightened. We're beginning to see the Holy Spirit in a different vein. We're seeing his power. We're seeing him working. All Christians everywhere are beginning to uh, rise in their understanding of God. It doesn't matter what church you go to. If you're born again, if you're truly born again, and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit is going to begin to open up your understanding. He's going to begin to lift you up. There's something that's happening worldwide in God's church. And we call it uh, an awakening, but that awakening is, is uh, functioning inside the confounds of the kingdom of God because God is getting ready for a phenomenal move. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and I, I can see Jesus, you know, he's just, he's just like, all right, come on, come on, get it, get it. He wants us to hurry up and start getting the understanding because he's, he's ready to smack some sense into some of these wicked people. Amen. Now, we deal with things different. David, remember some of David's prayers? Knock their teeth out, God. Grind them to dust. Don't let them you know, have any, any money or provision or, or, or anything, right? Because in the Old Testament, uh, if you were of the, the, the Gentile race, Gentile is anyone that wasn't Hebrew, right? There's only two types of people, the Hebrew and the Gentiles, and if you were a Gentile, then you basically were called a dog and you had no genealogy. In the Hebrew mind, you didn't exist. Come on now. And David would just say, because their fight was against flesh and blood. And if you would destroy your enemy, the, the more you destroy them and put the fear in them, then the longer you could dwell in the land without problems. Well, we can't do that now. The Bible says that we love. Now, I know there's some people in your life that you probably don't like a whole lot. But the Bible says, love them. And it doesn't mean, like I, I heard one lady, um, she says, uh, well, I love their spirit. It's their flesh I hate. <laughs> Right. But that's not what he said. He said, love them. This is the weapons of our warfare, because when we understand the power of the love of God and we understand the transformation that takes place on, in our heart, then when you begin to love someone and, and, and loose them from the offenses and from guilt and everything, then God begins to move in their life. And it may not be overnight, but listen, God knows what he's talking about. We need to open ourselves up and see what it is that God is telling us to do. Now, see, we've all become um, kind of um, cemented in our lifestyles as Christians. And, and human beings are, are habitual. And so we have this Christian habit. We get up and we go to church and sing a few songs, listen to a sermon, and then go home. And then you kind of, on the way to the, the car, you kind of shake yourself out of that, that doldrum, you know, and then go about your, your business, your life, until next Sunday, right? And the devil has six days to just hammer you with all kinds of stuff. Now, if you can't stay away from the news, at least watch some that might have a little bit of good in it, right? And then sit down and read your Bible. That's good news. So balance it out a little bit, amen, and see what God is doing in, in, in our life. So he said, in the, in the wicked place, the place that 
is against authority. He says that, uh, that it is an error. So they're living in an error. How many of you know that, that if you're living in an error, then eventually there's a price to pay? And that's what God said about us. He said, take the whole word of God, rightly divide it, meditate in it, walk it out the best that you can, knowing that the grace of God is there to help you. See, the grace of God enables us to do what we can't naturally do. None of us can really walk that perfect walk. We've tried. And there's some people that are very hard to forgive. It's hard to turn your cheek. There's some things that you're praying for, believing for, waiting for, and it doesn't seem like it happens, doesn't seem like it comes, doesn't seem like your prayers work. You know, the Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so all these things that we're trying to believe for and not happening is continually sickening our heart. That word sick means to make weak. And the heart is continually getting weaker and weaker and weaker with the spiritual influence. That means it's open and subject to the natural influence. So when you think about prayer, you think, well, let's pray for this. Well, um, last four times I prayed that, nothing happened. Well, who knows, something might happen. See, that attitude isn't going to get it because it's coming out of a sick heart, right? So we've got to come in to have confidence and boldness and know what it is that God promised us. You know, in the Bible, it talks about this, this young man that was walking along and, and they used to trap, you know, lions, tigers and bears in these pits and he's walking along and there was there was a, a, a lion down in that pit and he went over there and just jumped down in the pit and s slew the lion and crawled back out now you got to have some confidence <laughs> number one that lion is nothing but claws and teeth <laughs> number two it's mad and upset for being in a hole it can't get out of and number three, it might be real hungry. And he just jumped in there and killed it and then jumped back out. Well, well, listen, we need confidence. Is God your God, the only God? Is he the main God? Is he the God that can do all things? Is Jesus your Lord, your Savior? Is he the Christ that was formed in the flesh and suffered and died, raised from the dead, is seated at the right hand of God on the throne of righteousness right now? Are you inside of him? If you're inside of him, then the earth is his footstool. And it says we rule and reign from the heavenly place of righteousness. So we've got to begin to build confidence on the inside of us, that when we say a word, it's going to happen. Now, it takes a little while to get there, but if you faint and fall short of the mark, then you're never going to see the power of God unleashed in your life the way that the Bible says it will or the way that you would like it to because we falter and we fail. It says, don't give up. Don't fall short. Well, how long is it going to take? Well, that depends upon you. Everybody's different. The Holy Spirit knows our heart. He knows what's functioning in there. He knows our will. You know, the soul is what? The mind, the will, the emotions. Well, where's your emotions? See, most Christians don't think that God cares about your emotions, except if you get all messed up and fussed up and upset and everything else, then you need to come and say, I'm sorry. And then he forgives you, then you feel okay. But what you just demonstrated is you don't have any control over those emotions. If you drive by and you look at the price of gas and your heart goes, oh, your emotions are going to slay you. That's the moment when you look at price of gas, you just praise God, I have a full tank. Thank you, Jesus. 
Amen. Always have a full tank. Amen. And you get that confidence on the inside of you in your will. See, when your will taps into something, the whole universe changes to line up to, to your faith. Amen. So you need to get on the inside and say, I'll never be broke another day of my life. Amen. And it'll come from your heart and it's your will. And you know what that says? Somehow, somewhere, money's going to come to you no matter what because you've already determined, I will never be broke again another day of my life. Yes. Now think about it. Have you been broke? And have you had money? Which of them do you like? <laughs> it's not hard, right? I've been broke. I've been to the place that I didn't know what to do. I've been to the place where you had to really pray and believe for God. You know, two, first two years uh, of planting this church, Nancy and I, we ate if our faith worked. <clears throat> and the only money we received in, in, in salary the first two years was just enough money to, uh, to pay our rent in this messed up house. It was a pretty house, but they cut it in half and made two, two different things in there. And, and I won't go into all that detail, but anyway. So that was $150. So that was our salary, $150 a month for two years. But in that time, I developed an ability to believe God. And it got to the place it was a little dicey, I'll admit. I got in some places where I almost stepped over into begging. <clears throat> Hello. Almost stepped over into borrowing. Come on. And the reason I didn't get over into borrowing is because before we got married, uh, I, I borrowed uh, uh, like $300, you know, for at Christmas time so I could buy gifts for my family, All right? Because when I accepted the Lord, I lost my job. <laughs> my job was, was illegal also, <laughs> but... <laughs> And so I wanted to bless them, and so I borrowed $300 and, and bought presents and stuff. It took me a year to pay that off. And you know when I got it paid off? Right at the next Christmas. And they wanted me to take out another loan. I go, <laughs> no, I did that once. <clears throat> right? So listen, people, we've got to come to the place that we begin to lift up our heart in praise and adoration for our God and believe that he wants the best for us and that it costs the price of Jesus and his blood. There isn't anything more valuable in creation than the blood of Jesus Christ. And God quickly, easily, willingly paid that price to get us. Now, you think he's trying to get us to pay back? We could never pay it back. No, he used Jesus and his blood and his life to unfold to us an abundant life beyond imagination. Now, I know there's a lot of Christians that don't believe that, okay? But in their heart, they wished it was true. And all they got to do is open the Bible and see that it is true. Now, it can take a while because you've got so much stored up in your heart, all this poverty thinking. <clears throat> and I came to the place that I began to realize that it became easier to see my needs met. Well, that's not hard because surely God would like to meet my needs. But it wasn't very much that I got a little extra. And so you just kind of settle down and say, well, as long as my needs are met, I'm good. Praise God. Love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And you live that while, and pretty soon you just get caught in that lifestyle. And every so often you get a little bit blessed and you go buy something or do something. And it's like, that's awesome. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. 
and not knowing the whole time that I'm the one that's keeping me broke. I'm the one that's not allowing the abundance to come into my life. And then I look around and I see other people and they're doing pretty good. And I'm, you know, so subconsciously you start thinking, well, how come they're doing good? And I'm barely getting along. At least I'm getting along. I mean, Lord, if this is your will, I mean, I don't want to get you upset. Come on. This is kind of how we think. Until one day your heart opens up and you say, you know what? He didn't withhold anything from me. It's been me. Same thing with healing. Same thing with victory and relationships or over your emotions, your, your, your lifestyle, whatever it may be, the victory is already there. You have complete, total victory uh, over anything in this world. Any addiction will bow its knee to the name of Jesus. You just need to know how to, how to release that authority in who you are. The Bible says we're in this world. We're not of it. Addictions are of this world. Come on. Addictions are of this world. You don't see anybody complaining about being addicted to the Holy Ghost. You don't see anybody addicted to the Word of God that's messing their life up. It's all natural things. So what do we do? Walk away. So, well, it's just not that easy. It's that easy if you know how to do it. When you begin to realize that the Holy Spirit can step inside you and empower you to do what you can't do. Now, come on. I need to say that again. When you realize that the Holy Spirit can come into you and enable you to do what you can't do. So whatever it is you can't do, he can. He can. So all we got to do is, is, is just yield our heart to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, teach my heart how to believe in the finished work of Jesus. Right? Now, you've probably been taught so many things from different preachers and different uh, denominational viewpoints and, and, and philosophies and, and <laughs> doctrines and, and all this, and it doesn't line up with what the Bible says. See, it's easier for people to let someone else tell them what the Bible says instead of reading it. When I first started reading the Bible, I mean, it was like, it would probably be easier to learn Spanish, yeah. <clears throat> right? Because I, I did know a little bit of, of Spanish, taco, burrito, frijoli, <laughs> right? I wouldn't go hungry. But I didn't know the power of the Holy Spirit until I began to read the Word of God. And the Bible says... Uh, Yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. It calls him the, the Spirit of Grace. And that the Spirit of Grace on the inside of you will lead and guide you into all truth. And he will reveal the mysteries and the keys of the kingdom of God to you. That you can clearly see it and walk and live in that abundant life. You know, the Bible says, The thief cometh not but to steal to kill, and to destroy. Now, if you take that in context, it's literally talking about, uh, about religious teachers, teachers of the law, and that they come in, you know, and, and, and that, 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 that law that begins to get hold of you, well, what? It will steal, it will rob, it will kill. You know, the Bible says that the law is the strength of sin. And they spent their whole time trying to learn the law, memorize the law, walk in the law. And it's the strength of sin. I can't figure out. The deeper I get into the law of God, the stronger the sin is in me. I can't figure that out. 
And that's what Paul wrote in Romans 7. He says, why? I've come to a place that the things that I should do, I don't do. And the things that I shouldn't do, I keep doing them. He says, and I'm struggling, and I'm trying to reach out for this deliverance, but I see a law inside me, the law of sin and death, that when I step out to do what's right, the law of life, he says, then the law of sin and death arises within me, it wakens up. And he said, oh, perilous man, what am I going to do? And he says, I see. He says, so with my mind, that's the soul, right? He says, I will serve God even if my body serves sin. Now, what he's saying is, don't get so concerned about your flesh. Don't let us spend all your time, all the things of the flesh, all the things that you, you shouldn't be doing or other people are doing or what's going on. It's what? It's the natural, this natural life. He said, but turn away from it. How many of you found it's kind of difficult not trying to figure out what's going on? Hello? He says, but if you turn away from it and look at the spiritual things of God, get into the New Testament, the New Covenant, and that's from Acts through Revelation, and get into it and start reading it, and you find certain portions of scriptures, and you read them over and over and over and over. You know, Dave Roberson challenged me to read 1 John a hundred times. And I took on the challenge and I started reading it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And, you know, I got up to about 75 and went through 75 times just reading it. And if I could, he said, read it out loud. And I got up to around 75 times. And I'll tell you, something exploded on the inside of me. And I have never been the same. Never been the same. And I got so excited in what God was showing me and revealing to me in this, this, this new walk that I had. I didn't finish the other 25. <laughs> but you know what? I saw something. I saw that when I, when I pray in that heavenly language that God gave me that I didn't learn, when I release it and let it come out and the Holy Spirit is flowing through my spirit into my soul and out my mouth and, and then it goes into the, into the heart of the Father, then it comes out of Him through Christ into the Holy Spirit, into me, and it's this big cycle that keeps, keeps flowing. The brain says, what? That doesn't make any sense. I don't gonna, I'm not going to speak that language. I, don't, I can't get anything out of it. But it's not meant for you. It's meant for the Holy Spirit. It's meant for Jesus Christ. It's meant for God the Father. And it's meant for this cycle that keeps coming around. And then pretty soon as you're in the Word of God, then the Word just quickens and becomes alive and then understanding starts coming up and all of a sudden you start seeing things that you've never seen before you can understand how the word of god works you can understand how the kingdom of god works it begins to build you up and edify you you become that bold person that'll jump in a hole and kill a tiger you become a bold person that'll attack hell with an empty water pistol <clears throat> You become so inflamed and on fire with the things of God, right? And then pretty soon you say, praise God, you know, and, and, and a symptom comes upon your body. You say, I, you, you, get out of my body. And whoo, it's gone, right? And things start happening and your body's doing good and, and, and finances are changing and everything, you know. But see, that human part, then it says, whoa, we're doing pretty good. We'll just sit back. And just ride this wave. And you ride that wave for a little while. You know, and it's working. 
and you get a little bit comfortable, then pretty soon it just begins to wean and goes off. And you think, what's going on? It's like your car. You're going down the freeway. You're doing 70 miles an hour, just right down the freeway. So you're doing pretty good. So you just take your foot off the gas pedal. You think, I'm going to drive to Phoenix this way. Well, a couple of miles down the road, you're, you're doing 50. People are honking at you, going around, shaking their fist at you. Pretty soon you're doing 35, 25. And you're looking at the car going, what's wrong? And, and there's, there isn't anything wrong. What do you do? You need to push the accelerator again. Right? Why? Because you've been coasting. And basically... That's what Christians do. They coast. And a lot of times they coast and they see, a, they see a rest stop and they just coast right off. And they go over and they go, look, there's a nice, nice table here. Look at the grass here. Wow, we've got some shade trees. Let's just hang out for a while. And then one day they just kind of wake up and it's been 22 years. And something's stimulating them and they look at that car. And you think, I wonder if that thing will get up to 70 again. So you go get in it, and oh, the air takes right off. And you go, whoa, this is awesome. This is so fun. I don't know why I pulled in there for the last 22 years. And the Holy Ghost is there saying, I don't either. But see, that's kind of funny. But, but see, the same thing happens to us. When we're meditating in the word of God, the kingdom of God, and we're praying in the spirit, and we're worshiping God, and we're loving others, then your life begins to build. It begins to become fruitful. And if you take this on, not just a habit, but it's your lifestyle, and pretty soon you'll get into a place that things start working. Things will start happening in your life and you, you, you won't even have a chance to pray about it. It'll just happen. You'll just think, oh man, you know, I'd really like to have a new lawnmower. This thing had to pull it 62 times to get it started. I think I, I need a new... Knock, knock, knock. Hey, neighbor, I got this almost brand new lawnmower here and, and I don't need it. Would you like to have it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, see, this is what God wants in the kingdom. Yeah. It's what he really wants. Yeah. It isn't for us to fight and believe and pray and to speak with my mouth in Jesus' name. I have a new lawnmower. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I've got a new lawnmower. He wants to shower us yeah. with blessings. Praise God. This is how he's shaping the church. Because the church has run amok. And now there's hearts of people, a remnant, that are starting to open up and cry out to God. They're beginning to pray. They're coming alive again. They left the rest stop. And things are happening. <clears throat> I believe the Word of God is the final authority. Yeah. And that we should give our whole heart and life unto God and to the Word of God. If Jesus gave his whole life, we should give our whole life. That's what I believe. I, I don't believe that there's room to mix a bunch of stuff, right? And we get into a place that everything is getting watered down to the point that, 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 that our schools are a mess. Young people are a mess. And there isn't any fine line of finality about what is morality, what is being a Christian. What is doing what's right? What is the life that we should live? And the life that we should live is impossible to every one of us. That's why the Holy Spirit was given. That's why the grace of God is here to empower us to live a life that we can't live on our natural life. So you may be thinking, well, I can't do that. Well, you can with the Holy Spirit's help. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, right? <clears throat> now look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 27. It says, For by faith Moses forsook Egypt, 
not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So it says fearing the wrath, meaning this, that no fear of the king of fear or the force of a non-spiritual life was going to change the direction that he was headed and what he was going to do. Meaning that he was raised up in the palace and he had the greatest life anyone could want. And yet he realized that God is real. And when that hit his heart, it was not hard for him to set this whole thing aside and say, I'll have none of it. I'll step into what God has given me. Because basically, they knew that he was a Hebrew child. They raised him as a prince of Egypt. And he was heir to the, th- to the throne to be a, a ruler of Egypt. But everything that Egypt stood for was contrary to God. And so they said, we'll give you this if you'll just bow down. Now, where'd you see that again? Well, when Jesus started walking out, he was baptized. The voice came from heaven, said, this is my son. And he walked out and he went into the, into the desert and it was tempted. And the devil said, look at this. This is all the kingdoms of the world. This is the wealth. This is everything beyond what anybody could ever attain. People have wanted it. People have tried to subdue the world and could never do it. He said, I'll lay it at your feet if you'll lay at my feet. And Jesus didn't think twice. He didn't wonder about it. He just looked and said, it's written, Satan. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. And it says that the devil left him. But see, that is the attitude that is given to us by the Holy Spirit and by the grace of God. And that's where our will should be. Don't have a weak will. The will is I'll serve God, and God only will I serve. Is it a struggle? Yes. Are we going to miss it? Yes. But is it possible? Yes. The more we learn how to yield to the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit and the grace of God and the grace by faith. Faith is what? Calling those things to be not as though they are. I am convinced and I say right now, I have the ability to fulfill the will of God to the utmost of my life. I know the keys of the kingdom. I know the things of God. Okay? Someone says, well, do you really? No. But God says I do. So I come to a place that I choose to believe what he says. If he says I know and understand the mysteries of the kingdom, then I do. I do. I call those things to be not as though they are. And as you begin to walk in this way, all of a sudden, things begin to open up to you. You see things like you've never seen it before. You start going out into places that you've you've never let your mind get out in. There's so many phenomenal things that are out there. That is happening right now. A latter-day rain. A third-grade awakening. What is it doing? It's stimulating, stimulating the human race for what? For one of the greatest outpourings and movement of the spirit of God this world has ever seen. We're in it. We're in it. And as we open up our heart and open up our mind, then God says, thank you. He wants to use you. He's looking for people whose hearts are soft toward him. He doesn't care what your gender is. He doesn't care what your age is. He doesn't care anything about your race or anything like that. He sees us all complete in Christ. We're all the same. And he says, all you got to do is just give me half a chance. And I'll change that heart, and you'll be glad I did. 
the phenomenal things that will happen. See, it isn't all the things that we're trying to believe God to come to us. That's wrong thinking. We switch and say, God, bring all these things to other people. And he'll go right through you. And the hose always gets wet when the water goes through it. So whatever God is going to bring through you to other people, it's going to stop off at you. And he says, I'll give you your heart's desires. There's all kinds of religious people that got all kinds of anti-teaching of the goodness of God. But we need to believe that he is a good God. That he's not withholding anything from us, that he's trusting us. And that everything in our life is pliable and changeable. Your physical body is changeable. Your DNA is changeable. There isn't anything in natural existence that isn't changeable through the power of God. It's changeable. I read a testimony about a man in, in, in Canada that he was in prison for murder. <clears throat> and he hasn't gone to, uh, to court yet. And he received the Lord. And he received the Lord in such a big way, and he opened himself up. And you know that, that, that God changed his DNA, changed his fingerprints. <laughs> wow. The color of his hair changed. Now, I know I've got people out there, nah, blah, blah. well, then you don't serve a big God. What can God do? I mean, is it that hard to believe that God can change someone's fingerprints? Listen, he made man out of a lump of clay. Right? And so when they went to court, they had, they had no evidence against him and let him go. Now, he was true to God. He became an evangelist and traveled and drove around and, and, and preached. You know. Now, listen, I knew, I knew the brother of the driver of Bonnie and Clyde and some of those gangs of that time. He pastored a church right over here, not far from us, Sun City. When he was just a teenager, he had lost his eye. They were playing around with bow and arrows, and, and, and someone shot his eye, and it, uh, he lost the eye, and he had a, a glass eye in it. And his mother took him to a tent meeting. I forget exactly who was preaching. But they laid hands on him, and he began to see. His sight came back. And he, he was so excited and everything. And, and they're saying, well, that, that's, that's great. You know, we've seen blind eyes open. He says, no, you don't understand. My son has a glass eye. And, he, and the, eye, the glass eye was still there, and he could see perfectly. They, they covered up his good eye, and he could, he could see perfectly. He could read. And here's the thing. He could take the glass eye out, and he could still see. Come on. That's awesome. He was on television. I saw him on television. It's uh, the program, I, I can't believe, oh, I forget what it's called. Anyway, and, and he, he demonstrated. He took the eye out and he had the, the patch on the other thing and he'd have people come up and, and he'd read their driver's license and stuff. And, and the, the guy, you know, doing it, he didn't go, oh my God, where's Jesus? He said, oh, that's weird. Yeah. And that's all that affected him. See, what can God do? What can God do in your life if you turn him loose? What will happen if you, if you just let go of the hindrances of your heart and just open up to the grace of God and take it in and just say, God, I refuse everything that's natural life. I give myself to you. I receive you, Jesus. 
The first thing is you need to be born again. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need to believe that he was born of a virgin birth, that he suffered and died and was raised from the dead. You need to say, Jesus, come into my heart and give me life. Amen? It says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Then you take that fresh heart and you say, Holy Spirit, take my heart. Do with it what you want. More than likely, I'm going to struggle and I'm probably going to resist you. But don't pay any attention to me. Just bring that change to me anyway because the core of my heart says, I want change more than I want my next breath. I want to experience the fullness of what you have done in my life, Jesus, before I leave this earth. Just let me have a taste. Just let me have a touch. Just something. Let me feel it. Let me see it. Move through me to change other people's lives. Oh, man. Isn't that awesome? This is what's happening right now. God is shaping his church. You're going to be more excited about the things of God than you have in a long, long time. You're going to start hearing about more miracles happen than, than, than you have for, for, for decades. Things are going to happen left to right. You're, the power of God's going to be on you. It's going to be hard for you to, to be a closet Christian. I mean, everywhere you go, people are going to get healed. People are going to just open up themselves to you. Everywhere. This is phenomenal. This is God. God's doing it. It's not because we get uh, 100 million people together and pray. This is God based on the shed blood of Jesus Christ that is pouring down into his church right now. It's happening. It's happening right now. Aren't you glad? You need to be part of it. We want you to be part of it. Just say, God, let me be part of it. Let me be part of it. Have your will in my life. In Jesus' name, amen.